So you folks already know that I'm Nancy. I am IDTC's program manager, and I am excited to introduce Dr. Jaylene Harris, who is a resident at Cornell University's vet school. She is all about imaging, and I'm going to keep my part short and turn it over to her. And I'm going to pin you, Jay. So okay, um, my internet is slow, so I am going to turn off my video just so hopefully my slides don't lag behind. But um, I will pop back on when I'm done, or if there's questions. So let me turn that off, and then oh, you have to enable screen sharing for me. Enable screen sharing. There you go. I'm hoping that that's going to allow you to do that. Hmm. Let me stop this because I did, I have to, I think stop, I think, hello, stop, stop the share on the subject of slow. <laughs> there we go. I think I need to. I think if you go to participants, uh, and then I need to make multiple invite. Becky, you are my YouTube expert. So you can do two things. You can go open up participants. I did. It says just invite. Um, and you can't find Jay's name. And I think if you hover over my name. Yeah, hover over Jay's name mm -hmm. and go to the right. It says more. OK, where did you go, Jay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, hover over Jay's name, which is Recording, I'm gonna remove pin. I'm gonna remove pin first of all. I'm gonna come back here, adding more people. Okay, start video, make host. I'm gonna make you the, a co host. Okay. Yeah, if you make her a co host, she'll be able to share. Okay, there we go. Thanks for bailing me out. All right, your co host. Yay, okay. Yes, you should be able to. There you go. Everyone can see her slides. Yes, no, yes, no, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Yay. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, yes, uh, I guess I can start. I hope most people are here. Um, there's a first bit of this that is going to be uh, relatively quick. I wanted to show you guys some anatomy, but all of the fun bits are at the end. So I don't want to um, not get to that. So we'll kind of go quickly through the first bit. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I grew up in Montana, North Central. Um, I do have a uh, fondness for dog training. So I did train my St. Bernard in 4-H and FFA when I was really little. And then um, I have a cattle dog that I started in herding. Um, that school kind of got in the way. So he kind of became my trick dog, if you will. And I've just enjoyed that. And then my newest puppy, Jake, is actually in nose work. Uh, both of them uh, did the um, obedience training actually with Kathy and Jackie uh, through the Ithaca Dog Training Club when we moved here. Uh, went to MSU in Bozeman for undergrad and then uh, vet school at Colorado State. I did two years in Texas um, doing internships in veterinary medicine, both equine and small animal. And then I uh, was in Dallas for a year uh, where I did my master's degree actually in veterinary forensics. And now I'm here at Cornell um, doing an imaging residency. Uh, just in case you hear these guys in the background, I apologize in advance. The chances of this happening is high. So these are my pets. Uh, that way, when you hear them, you know who they are. Okay, uh, great. So some of the things we're going to cover. Um, so I just want you to understand uh, anatomical planes of motion in directional terms um, when it comes to the animal's body, um, how we properly like hang an x-ray and then identify the five x-ray opacities and be able to use uh, appropriate ultrasound um, terminology. Uh, and then we're gonna go through basic thoracic, abdominal, and musculoskeletal skeletal imaging on x-rays and ultrasound. Um, and the last two bits are probably the most important um, for me to explain to you guys is why sometimes when you, you know, have a pet that uh, needs imaging, why sometimes we have to take multiple projections and views and then why um, do x-rays not answer everything and when we need to use advanced imaging such as ultrasound, CT or MRI. 
All right, first up, anatomic planes and directions. So the main planes of motion uh, for the dog are, there's three of them. There's a sagittal plane that is gonna divide the dog into right and left halves. This is the big blue line. Um, and then the dorsal plane will divide the dog into top and bottom halves. And lastly, the transverse plane uh, divides the body into front and back halves. And so from, uh, I guess I better, one more, one more slide. Oops. Uh, so from those planes, the median plane truly does kind of, it's an imaginary slice to the dog right through the middle. But if we're going to be off exact midline, we call it a sagittal plane. Uh, it's the same thing, just off or on midline. And from these planes, we start talking about anatomical direction. So we can move like towards the head, towards the tail, and those have some specific words. Uh, the main reason for me bringing these up are because I may be using them in some of the uh, examples I give you, and I just didn't want you to not know them. Uh, we'll go th through them quickly. Dorsal and ventral. So dorsal is always towards the back or towards the sky, if you will, and then ventral towards the belly or bottom of the dog. Uh, cranial caudal is towards the head or towards the tail. It gets a bit awkward in the head, though, when I'm right between the eyeballs and I say move cranial. Well, you can't move towards the head when you're on the head. So we have to use rostral, uh, which means towards the nose. Uh, okay, cranial caudal still works until we get down uh, to the distal, to the bottom part of our legs. Um, and then we have to change turns. Again, a little confusing because dorsal, instead of meaning towards the back this time, when you're in this lower part of the limb, it's gonna mean towards the front. And then palmar and plantar are used uh, for the back part of the uh, bottom limb. If you're in the front limb, it's palmar, and then back limb is plantar. Uh, so if you guys have heard of like plantar fasciitis, it's the back limb. Uh, proximal distal, uh, this refers to the limbs really only. Uh, proximal just means more towards the body and distal is more towards the toes. So the elbow would be proximal to the foot. And then medial lateral. Um, so lateral is away from midline and medial is towards midline. So this dog, for example, the green part uh, next to the eye is the lateral campus of the eye and the blue is medial campus of the eye. That's the, gonna be the same over here. So medial is still towards the inside and lateral is still towards the outside. Uh, this is my favorite one. <laughs> Lastly, deep and superficial. So when we're talking about superficial structures are towards the outside of the body and then deep is gonna be like the inside. So we will talk a little bit about how we hang our images. And this is a pretty standard way to hang them um, really for throughout veterinary medicine and mostly for human medicine as well. Um, when we have an x-ray, the head of the patient is always going to be up um, on our screen or towards the left. Uh, it's similar though, when we're on the limbs of the dog, um, the head is still going to be up and the, uh, I guess the head is still going to be towards the left. Um, so depending on how the dog is standing, um, this is the head's going to be up here, but also in some joints, we can turn this as a normal standard projection. Uh, so if the dog was laying on his stomach, that's normal, or the dog can be standing head towards the right or towards the left. So we mainly do this um, to standardize how we hang things and how things um, appear. So our eyes are not tricked and it's kind of a uniform process. Uh, and then when it comes to labeling in some of the images I'll show you later, uh, it can be confusing because we label the right side, but it's on the left of our screen. And we do this because if you look at the dog laying on his back, standing above him, his right limb is gonna be to our left. So that's why we label the right side on the left um, when we put the image up. And then lastly, if he's laying on his side like this uh, thorax and abdomen, um, we are gonna label it what side he's laying on. So for example, this little guy is laying on his left side, we're gonna label this as a left uh, lateral. Um, and then on our limbs, same thing. Uh, our marker is going to indicate which leg we are um, imaging and uh, which 
uh, that should go cranial or it should go so towards the head or it should go to the lateral aspect towards the outside. Uh, a few things to note in some of the examples I'll give you. Um, gas can redistribute and the most obvious form of this is gonna be in the stomach. Um, so there's parts to our stomach, our little fundus is kind of right when the esophagus enters and then you have the big body and then you have your pylorus here. So whether or not the dog is laying on its right or left side, gas is gonna redistribute through here because sometimes we'll have gas, sometimes we will have fluid and sometimes we'll have a mixture. So for example, this is the stomach in this dog and you can see it's basically the same shape as the um, image below. But when we lay the dog on its side, um, gas is gonna redistribute up into the fundus on a right lateral and down into the pylorus on a left lateral. So if gas is here, and this is on the right side of the body, he lays on the other side, gas is gonna rise up into this portion. So left lateral, it rises into the pylorus. Okay, let's talk about some shades of gray on our um, images. We'll start, first start off with um, x-rays or, or uh, radiographs. So there's five uh, radiographic opacities, we call them, or shades of gray. Uh, the first and most dark black on the image is going to be air or gas. And you can see that because outside of the dog's body, it's all gas or there's gas within the uh, colon and small intestine. Then we have fat, which is um, still dark, darker than the soft tissues of the leg, but uh, has a little bit of whiteness to it. Soft tissues. Um, and then bone and mineral. So those are our five um, densities, if you will, or five colors. Um, and you can see, for example, like here's a piece of fat um, between the hind limb muscles. Okay, ultrasound's a bit different though. We don't have that exact uh, five, opa or five uh, opacities. We describe something based on its appearance compared to something else. So um, we use the term echogenicity for this, and echogenicity is just gonna be the amount of echoes or the amount of whiteness in our ultrasound image. So if it has no echoes, it's anechoic, and then you can go all the way up to hyperechoic. And then there's two in-between ones, hypo and iso. So take, for example, this uh, box down here. We have four different nodules of different color against the background uh, tissue. This is anechoic, it's truly black. This is hypoechoic, it's not fully black. It has some echoes, but it is darker than the surrounding tissue. And then uh, isoechoic is pretty much the same. I mean, you can really not tell the margins of this module. And then hyperechoic, where it stands out and is more white. Um, so we use these, for example, this is a kidney. Um, and this is how we tell uh, if there's disease within organs or if um, the entire organ is diseased. Uh, for example, this is liver and this is spleen. The liver normally should be hypoechoic to the spleen, but the liver is not hypoechoic in and of itself. It has echogenicity. And then lastly, this top image is just to show you that some things can be smooth and homogenous, or some things can be kind of stippled where it has hyper and hypoechoic regions, and that's heterogeneous. Uh, okay, uh, we'll get into some of the anatomy. So this I'll probably go relatively quickly through. Um, first axial skeleton, which is basically the spine and the head. Uh, there are um, regions of our spine that we um, identify and it's similar to humans. So this is a human uh, spine. You have cervical, which is the neck, um, thoracic, lumbar, uh, sacral, and then coccygeal. Uh, so one thing we do, each species has a different number of those certain vertebrae. So dogs have seven uh, cervical vertebra, uh, 13 thoracic, seven lumbar, three sacral. And then obviously if, how long their tail is, depends on how many caudal uh, vertebrae they have. Uh, I just thought I would highlight these. Fun fact, all species have seven cervical, cervical vertebra, even the giraffe, uh, so that never changes. Um, all the thoracic vertebra have ribs associated with them. So if it doesn't have a rib, it's not thoracic. This is also what makes up the withers. Uh, and then lumbar, this is the region of the loin. It's also the most common site for intervertebral disc disease in our well-known long-backed dogs, most notably the dachshund. 
caudal uh, vertebra, again, these are what are going to be removed if you dock tails. Okay, uh, on the, uh, we're going to move to append appendicular skeleton, which is the limbs. Um, there is external anatomy or regions that we describe and talk about. So the shoulder is a joint, but it's also a region um, here. And then you have brachium, anabrachium, and manus in the front limb, where you have hip, thigh, cruce, and pace in the back limb. And I just want to show you that these really do correlate to the joints um, internally, but those are external terms. Uh, oh yeah, and then I guess I added this little guy. If it's if you're talking about a horse, it's called the gaskin. So if you guys have heard of that, it's the same thing as the as the cruce. Uh, thoracic limb. We'll go through these quickly. Um, first up, you have the scapula. Um, it's a blade-like bone, um, obviously, and this is just part of a uh, scapula. It's hard to see in some of our rads unless you really try to identify it. It's obviously difficult to image because it's very closely attached to the um, to the body. Humerus um, is the only bone of our brachium, um, and these are just what a humerus looks like on x-rays. Uh, your radius, um, so this is the smaller bone of the antebrachium, uh, but uh, in some species it is the main bone because the, the next bone, the ulna, is actually fused, but not in the dog. These two bones are very distinct. Um, so the ulna is basically what creates that point of the elbow. Um, and it's the, it's the major bone of our antebrachium. And then lastly, the manus, which includes um, all of the little bones of the wrist or carpus, and then all of the bones of the digits. Uh, so our joints, we have shoulder, elbow, knee, and then metacarpophalangeal. Um, these are just also some fancy names for them. So the knee, or what we would call our wrist, is truly the knee in the dog, um, and it is also called the carpus. Um, whereas the bottom joints are going to be metacarpophalangeal. It just means um, metacarpal are these bones and phalangeal bones are these bones. And so it's literally just identifying that that's the joint between the metacarpus and the phalangeal joints. And I bolded carpo there because it's the same term in the um, hind limb, as you'll see here coming up soon. But instead of carpo, we'll, we'll switch it to tarso. Okay, going to the pelvic limb. Uh, we have the pelvis, which is in and of itself made of multiple bones that all fuse together. Um, of note, our acetabulum, where our hip uh, joint attach, or our hip joint is, or our femur attaches, uh, is very important in some of our working dogs. Femur, the only bone of the thigh. Uh, tibia, the uh, largest bone of our cruce. Uh, the fibula some, is usually present in dogs. Uh, some species it's absent, but it can be very, very small and uh, the dogs don't actually uh, truly need this bone for weight bearing. Uh, there's the little fibula. And so you can see in some of our x-rays, it really gets hidden um, by the tibia unless you have a certain view of it and then still it gets hidden just a bit. Uh, the pace, which literally means foot, includes the tarsus um, here, or hawk if you're in a large animal species, um, and then all of those digits. So again, the joints, um, you have hip, uh, and all these joints are named based off of the bones. So coxo just means the coxa of the pelvis to femur, so coxofemoral, your stifle joint, um, hawk, which is called the tar tarsus, and then again, this metatarsophalangeal is going to change for the hind limb. Okay, a bit about organs. Um, I just wanted to make note that there are many types of digestive systems out there in our animals. Dogs fall under this monogastric um, type. So they have one stomach versus a ruminant that has compartmentalized stomach and horses and rabbits that are hind gut fermenters. So their GI system is truly pretty straightforward. They have one stomach, they have you know, a loop of small intestine um, and really just a uh, small, rather puny colon compared to some others. And I just wanted to highlight for you how different these can be. If you look at the cecum of the horse here and compare that to the tiny little cecum of this dog, uh, truly the cecum doesn't do much for our, our little furry friends. Um, compared to the 
rumen in the cow and then the spiral colon of the pig. So I just wanted to identify that that truly has a simple GI tract. Um, going on to heart, um, there are basically four chambers of the heart. You have the right and left sides, and then you identify the right. The top portion is the atrium, um, and the bottom portion is the ventricle. Um, the only other two things I'll point out that would be of importance is our tricuspid valve, um, which is the valve between our right atrium and ventric ventricle, and then our uh, mitral valve, which is between our left atrium and left ventricle. Okay, let's apply that at least to um, the x-rays. So uh, this is a normal, um, you know, top view. So our, our ventrodorsal view and our lateral view um, of a dog. And a lot of structures um, can actually be identified from uh, just these images. It looks like a lot of black and white, but truly um, I've highlighted quite a few of those structures and, and not even all of them that we can see. So we have our windpipe, our trachea uh, coming down here. And I'm gonna go back because that trachea is filled with gas and we can easily identify that. Whereas our esophagus, um, since it is a very small structure and um, kind of blends in with some of these other structures, we don't actually see him unless he's abnormal. Uh, we do see uh, certain lymph nodes um, throughout the um, thorax or chest, um, obviously our big heart. Uh, leaving from the heart, we have a caudal vena cava, which takes um, blood back to the heart from the rest of the body, and then our diaphragm, which separates uh, our thorax from our abdomen, um, and then just poking in here, we have some liver and stomach, which I've highlighted over here as well. Oh, I forgot the lungs. Obviously, the lungs are very important. They are the big black structure under our rib cage. Uh, within the heart, though, we uh, can actually further identify parts of the heart. So um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just wanted to point out that truly I, I can say if there's, you know, right heart, right sided or right atrial enlargement based on this area being enlarged or not. And then similarly here on the lateral. So nothing that uh, truly I want you guys to memorize, but just showing that uh, the heart of itself is a complex structure just on uh, x-rays alone. Uh, moving to abdomen, um, there's also a lot of black and white that gets a bit confusing, but there are structures um, that we sh can identify. Um, and I'll go back and forth here. The liver is going to be the most cranial um, in the abdomen next to the diaphragm, followed by stomach. Um, and we talked about gas in the stomach can kind of redistribute. Um, kidneys get a bit confusing because if you look in this view, they're really hidden. A lot of times we can see left kidney. On x-ray, we can't always see this right kidney, though, because it's hidden by a lot of the um, other GI, but we can see them fairly well on our lateral image. Uh, small intestine is all over the place. Typically, though, the majority of it lives on the right side of the abdomen. It can live over on the left, but usually on the right. Um, spleen, uh, you're only really going to see it, unless it's enlarged, only see it here on the, or the head of the spleen on the VD view. But on the lateral view, you're going to see it in the um, bottom part of the abdomen. And this is the splenic tail. So we don't get a really good look at the spleen on x-rays, um, but we can look at the head and tail to see if there's generalized um, enlargement of it. Uh, lastly, colon and bladder. Um, colon is this kind of question mark shaped um, structure, again, kind of overlying everything. Uh, I just wanted to show you the difference of a cat and a dog. So let's go back. Here's the dog. You can still see some of those structures I pointed out, but not really well defined and not very clearly. I just wanted to show you the difference in some of our smaller patients, like our chihuahuas and our cats. We actually can see these things quite clearly because they have quite a bit of fat in their abdomen to help those things stand out. Okay, move into ultrasound. Um, this is, I just wanted to get you guys a couple pictures so you can see what some structures look like. Um, this is liver. Um, it is normally kind of stippled like this with little white flecks. And then these are our vessels. Whereas spleen um, is more homogenous. It's more smooth, uh, more evenly distributed with our white speckles. And we really don't have those uh, randomly distributed uh, vessels that we see in our liver. Kidney. Um, Pretty identifiable. Um, it has this outer margin, the cortex, and then this inner dark margin, the medulla. Um, 
So this guy, this guy usually stands out pretty good. Uh, another fun fact, so dog kidneys, um, the kidney bean, it actually looks like a kidney bean shape that we would think of. Uh, however, there are species uh, variances like the cow that's like a grape-like cluster and then the horse actually has a, their right kidney is shaped like a heart. So dog kidneys truly are both of them kidney bean shaped. Um, here's bladder. So bladder should have um, anechoic urine within it. And so that's what basically this is, um, is urine. Um, our little adrenal glands, um, they also look like a little peanut. Um, they live cranial to our kidney. And then pancreas. Uh, pancreas is not seen on ultrasound easily at all unless it's upset and angry. So this dog has pancreatitis here, um, but typically we don't, we don't see pancreas on ultrasound. Gallbladder. Um, so similarly to the urinary bladder, the gallbladder is going to have anechoic fluid within it. Um, that's our bile. Uh, you can tell as well that this is surrounded by some sort of tissue. So this is all liver. And then within the gallbladder, this bit is bile salts that have kind of uh, settled out. One more fun fact, horses don't have a gallbladder, but dogs, all dogs do. Okay, this is... Oh, Okay, my favorite part, at least of the presentation so far. So uh, let's start with some case examples. Um, so why sometimes when you take our, uh, our pets to the vet, do we need so many images just to you know, find an answer? And these are some of the reasons why, and we'll go through um, each of them. So in some cases, we don't need a lot of images to be able to help answer the question. This is an example of that. Uh, when we place a urinary catheter um, in a cat or dog, um, we just need to say, you know, is it in the bladder? Because truly there's only one orifice out here that we're gonna put it into. Um, we're not gonna put it in the rectum. So we, we can tell this is in the bladder just off of one view. Another example of this is maybe when we do a puppy count. Um, we don't need multiple views to say, yes, I see one, two, three different little mineralized skulls um, within this dog. But sometimes we do need multiple views. So this is an example of why we might need that. So this dog um, is a five month old male intact lab that was hit by a car. Uh, they um, palpated uh, the clinician or the primary doctor palpated some pain on the left uh, leg. And so they took this image to see if they could see anything. And right here at the top of our image is this little sharp margined piece of bone. And so we wanted to look at that a little closer. When we um, took another image centered on that location, we can see that it's not just one fracture and it's not small, it actually is pretty extensive but we haven't really characterized how many fractures there are and how bad this is because at the end of the day, some pelvic fractures don't have to be repaired and some absolutely do if it's on the weight bearing axis. So we have to get this other view to see how many fractures are involved and where those are located. There are numerous fractures through here. Here's one, here's two, here's three, four. Lo and behold, the head of the femur is sitting right here and it's no longer attached to the femur. So without this view, without taking that other orthogonal image, we would have uh, no idea, uh, the full, or at least the, the full picture. All right, another example of orthogonal views, um, placing an NG tube. So this is like a feeding tube or a tube that we put into the stomach um, to drain some fluid. Uh, this is a four-year-old female speed beagle. Um, she has diabetes and she was here being treated for that. So this truly was a feeding tube. Um, I want to point out that, yes, we see the trachea and we see um, the white feeding tube here, but up in the front end, we have one orifice that can branch out into two different structures, right? The esophagus or the trachea. And we really need to identify, especially if we're putting food down this thing, where it's at, because otherwise um, we could put food into the lungs and, and that's not good. So I've highlighted here the trachea and feeding tube. And just on this view, I can't tell you if this is in the esophagus or trachea because it is very easy to go through the trachea and into one of the smaller little airways of the lungs. Um, and I, I can't tell based on this picture. But when I get that orthogonal image, um, you can see I've highlighted again, 
uh, the trachea and feeding tube. And I can tell that feeding tube actually lies outside of the trachea um, and doesn't, doesn't go within it. So it has to be an esophagus at this point. So this patient was approved to be fed through that tube. Again, I wouldn't have had that um, just based on the other images. Uh, another example, because it's just super important to drive home why we need um, different views. Uh, this is another example of a feeding tube, but instead of going through the nose into the throat, this cat or this uh, dog had to actually have uh, his a hole made into the side of his neck to place this. Um, so it should be in the esophagus um, because they they purposely placed it there on surgery. But if you look at the end of this tube, um, it's meant to be just in the esophagus and not stomach. Um, so we told them that this tube was too far in um, and they needed to pull it out a little bit. So they pulled it out and we were much happier with this. Um, I'll kind of zoom up on that. This guy is within the stomach. The stomach margin is here and this guy is not. Super important in patients, um, small patients especially, because um, this tube can cause a lot of irritation of the caudal esophagus and um, actually cause uh, bad complications and, and make the animal nauseous. Okay, um, <laughs> another one. This is actually probably one of my favorite cases. This is a four-year-old female speed Yorkie. Um, she came in for just a right front lameness, limping. Uh, they um, identified the pain to be of the elbow. And we took this view and we were like, oh, we don't see much, but when you take the opposite view, that's not normal. Um, that is fully luxated, um, which requires surgical intervention. Here's another foreign, uh, another foreign body dog, um, seven-year-old male neutered mixed breed. Um, he's coughing intermittently, not eating um, for three days, and lo and behold, he ate a rabbit carcass. So um, dorsal to the trachea here, where the esophagus lives, is this little bone fragment. And um, we know it's bone because it's the same color as this. He also has the history of eating a rabbit uh, carcass, but um, it looks pretty small. It looks like this dog should be able to pass this, no problem, until we get to this other view. And this thing, I'll zoom in, is actually very large and very, very sharp, um, of which we can't tell here. It looks like it has rounded, smooth margins. Uh, it was lying to us, and this dog absolutely should not be able to swallow this and, and go home. He, we need to do something about this. Okay, enough with the um, orthogonal views. We're going to do center of collimation now. So five-year-old male neutered poodle, um, he presented for swelling of the right elbow. Uh, we can see that all of this soft tissue is, is pretty thick. Elbows aren't supposed to be that thick. Um, but uh, something else that's in the picture that maybe our eye isn't drawn to at first is this guy. And he's not normal. So the other leg actually has a lesion. Um, and we can't fully characterize it here. And we don't know if this is just superimposed um, soft tissue or if this is a true bony lesion that might be infection or cancer. Um, so when we, when we take the other view and really zoom up on this, we can see that it's really extensive and involves almost half of that humerus. Um, and it's, it's affecting the humerus all the way around, not just um, one portion of it. So this unfortunately um, was cancer um, of which uh, we really wouldn't be able to tell just on the one view that we, we had before. Okay, um, feeding tube. Uh, one more. Um, this case is just really to drive home kind of what I've been talking about so far. This is a one-year-old female spade Boston Terrier. Um, she had a allergic reaction, a very severe allergic reaction uh, called anaphylaxis. Um, and she, this tube was placed to feed her. And you would think that this, you know, it kind of lies within the trachea, but then it really extends back into the stomach here. I don't have any orthogonal views because this was the only view given to the um, radiologist at that time. Uh, he said, yep, it's in the stomach, good to go, start feeding. This tube was actually uh, within the lungs, uh, believe it or not. So this uh, patient accidentally was fed uh, food into the lungs, which was not good. So 
just to drive home the point that it can really look certain ways, but um, that just to just to really look out for pet and patient safety, that we need multiple multiple views to really answer the questions. Okay, moving on to patient size. Uh, for example, this is three different patients. There's a little bird, a little puppy, and then a, a, another smaller dog, I think maybe Chihuahua. Um, all of these patients, you can pretty much image the whole body um, in just you know one or two images. He, he fits within our x-ray beam, but a patient like this um, does not fit in our x-ray beam. Uh, this is how many images we actually had to take just to get one study of this dog's abdomen um, in making sure that we are overlapping and not missing something. So um, our bigger dogs, we're gonna need more views than, than our smaller dogs. And so um, that, can, that can be pretty pricey sometimes. I didn't have a good dog example for this, um, but I think this horse is gonna drive it home. Um, it, it happens again in our dogs, but our, our dogs are such like they're smaller patients, obviously. So we can typically um, try to rotate them and, and see what we need and not have to do so many additional views. Um, this horse, though, there's two images here of his knee or his carpus, and one is from the side, which is going to be this view, and one is from the front. So our x-ray beam is shooting from the front of him, going in the dorsal aspect of his leg, out the palmar aspect of his leg, um, and that's this view. So just from these views, at first, I, you know, I, I don't really see much. Um, sure, there's a little bit of soft tissue swelling here, but the bones truly look okay. But when I shoot from an angle here and here in these two views, I can actually start to pick out that something is majorly wrong. And it's, it's this little bit on, on this bone. We can see um, a pretty traumatic fracture that extends all the way through that bone with a little chip um, fragment. And so this horse definitely needed surgery. Without these oblique views, um, we, we wouldn't have been able to see that and diagnose it. So even though our standard views are these ones, um, sometimes we have to get just a little bit creative um, and take more. Okay, example of stress views. So this is a one-year-old female intact coonhound. Um, she presented for limping on the left hind. Um, these are our standard views for our stifle joint and our hock joint. Um, so this is the, the crust region of the limb in our hind limb. And so far, everything looks pretty normal. Um, I, I think I might comment on some effusion of this joint, but I, I wouldn't have diagnosed this dog with truly anything um, we were questioning whether or not just comparatively on this view, if this side, the medial side of this joint space was a little bit thinner from this side. And so we were wondering if this side was actually had something wrong with it. And so we applied pressure or force um, just via a spoon to uh, the side of the limb. So the arrow is explaining where the uh, force was put during the x-ray and so you can see force was placed on both sides to kind of try to open up that joint space. Here is a normal um, view for comparison. And um, we can see that that joint space is actually severely widened uh, when we apply force this way compared to this side. Whereas when we apply the force the opposite direction, it's really not. So this dog has instability um, of his, the lateral aspect of his stifle. Um, so that's the only way we could have gotten this diagnosis is applying those stressed views. Um, he also had his patella, his kneecap was luxated as well, which we can see in, in the other views, I believe. Nope, they look normal too. So those stressed views helped um, identify that this uh, little patella was not sitting right in the middle. Okay, we will go to why some advanced, advanced imaging sometimes. Um, so why x-rays, you know, might not be able to answer the questions we need. Um, so this is a two-year-old male neutered pit bull. Um, he came in for a painful um, abdomen and he had been vomiting a couple times that day. Um, so when I look at this, um, the stomach has a bunch of gas in it. 
Um, but all of this intestine is really bunched up and looped and has tight curls. That's not normal. If you remember that drawing, it should be relatively smooth. It's going to loop, but it, it shouldn't be hard to see and it shouldn't have these kind of C-shaped um, gas opacities in it. It either should be full of fluid or uh, have a mild amount, a little bit of gas, um, but not like this where there's lots of multiple little flecks of gas. So we took this dog to ultrasound um, and in ultrasound, this is what we saw. So let me start with the normals. This is his small intestine and normal small intestine should have all of these layers. Um, they have kind of a white, dark, white, dark, and then this middle layer is lumen. And then we basically mirror image that. So this is the center of the intestine on the inside. And then we have the layers again for the outside, the dark light, dark light. Um, so these are two examples of normal. This dog has a little bit of um, food in his small intestine. And so this thick white line is the, the inside of it, the lumen part of it. Whereas everything else is just the normal wall. Um, but we can see that it's pretty straight. I mean, it, it has a little bend, but it, it's, it's relatively straight as we, um, uh, as we scan over it. This intestine is severely abnormal. Um, if I'm gonna follow it, it comes in and out does it again and again, and just continues to repeat this really kind of scrunched up appearance, um, which is consistent with what I'm kind of seeing here. If I see these little gas bubbles, those little gas bubbles are gonna be sitting right in these little um, small segments. Um, but we can fully characterize it here and say, nope, it's not a mass in the abdomen, it's just the intestine are, are abnormally shaped. And I think this picture kind of drives it home. So if you think of the you know, scrunchy on your, um, oh, what do you wanna call it, sweatpants, if we have a string within a hole or lumen, it's gonna get bunched up and it's gonna be really plicated is what we call it, or really tight. And that's exactly what this small intestine is doing. Here's a live example of, of how kind of curvy and plicated this intestine can be. Um, so that dog, uh, based on ultrasound was diagnosed with a linear foreign body. So not just a ball or toy, but a piece of string. Um, and we can see the string, well, this is an example, um, but we can see the linear string in this case. When we go review the case that the actual dog that we were looking at, um, we can kind of see a linear structure here, but it's not always that clear. And we certainly would not be able to see you know, this structure, we have evidence that something's abnormal and our ultrasound supports, you know, what the x-rays are showing, but those x-rays um, didn't necessarily diagnose this linear foreign body. Um, and what happens most of the time is this is stomach um, coming into the small intestine and a bunch of string usually gets caught up in the um, pylorus there in the uh, kind of last part of the stomach. And when that string follows the small intestine, well, that small intestine is going to try to move and try to move things through it, right? So when it does that, the string's not going anywhere, it's tethered in the stomach and it causes this plication or this kind of swirling bit of, loop in, of the loops of intestine. So truly ultrasound was what, um, was what diagnosed this uh, linear foreign body in this dog. Okay, um, so an example of why we might need CT. Um, this is a two-year-old female spade um, mastiff. She came in for um, swelling of her neck, mostly on the left side. Um, she does have a history of eating an entire chicken carcass within the last couple of days. So what I see here is I, I see this soft tissue swelling um, and it actually extends from kind of the jaw all the way down the neck. Um, the trachea is here in black with all the gas inside of it, but this other stippled gas material, that's not in the trachea. That's actually um, what we presume to be uh, potentially esophagus or just within the tissues of the neck. Um, looking at it on this view, it follows a little bit too far lateral for where esophagus should sit. Esophagus should really live next to um, trachea, but we can't say for, for sure. So unfortunately, this dog actually didn't have a CT 
but this is one that we really needed it in um, because this ended up being an abscess um, of the neck and th this truly wasn't in esophagus. So we have reason to believe that it could be, but we don't know um, and we don't know the extent of it. So we, we really wish we had a CT of this dog. It would have been awesome um, because if there's um, involvement of the esophagus, um, unfortunately that's a, a pretty poor prognosis because the esophagus doesn't um, handle surgery very well, but this helps um, kind of decide the path of treatment what kind of medicines it needs to be on? Does it need to go to surgery or is it, you know, something in just the esophagus that, uh, that we could do just treat medically instead of going to surgery. So sorry, I don't have an example of this CT because um, we didn't do one, but this is an example of, of why we need that. I have a few more uh, CT examples though for you. So this dog we saw earlier, right? This was that um, pelvic fracture uh, where we actually had lots more fractures. So we can see the extent of it now, but we don't know um, if there's any soft tissue damage, um, if there's any bleeding, hematoma, um, what direction these things are displaced. And so truly a lot of times for CT, we actually need um, that imaging to identify our surgical plan and, and where to go from there. So this dog did get a CT. Um, these are the images uh, of the CT, and then we did a 3D reconstruction um, just so we could see, and this really helps us uh, plan uh, surgery as well. So in these images, I just took a couple to show you how many um, shards and fractures of, of that pelvis there are um, throughout all of this. Um, this is just a side view. So this is looking at the dog, dog top down, just like this images, and this is from the side. Uh, but what we did not see on x-rays, you can go back, um, this hip looks like it's in place and like it's uh, really well adhered and it's not subluxated or it's not popped out. When we do CT, that's not the story. This, the head of the femur is not sitting within this acetabulum, within that hip joint. Um, and the x-rays did not show us that. So this also helped identify that there was abnormality um, in the uh, right hip as well. That's super important because dogs can actually, sometimes surgical, surgically, we will go in and just cut the head of the femur off. The dog does not need this joint to um, walk and to move around. But if we have one bad hip joint, we know this hip joint is going to get a lot of arthritis. It's not in the normal um, position later in life that it, maybe they need to repair this head of the femur and put it back on instead of just leaving it off. And that's exactly what they did. So this CT truly answered um, not only how many fractures there are, to what extent are they? They gave us a surgical plan, but not only that, it, it truly directed the surgical plan saying, ooh, don't just leave this. Um, even though he could be fine without fixing this, we need to fix it now because we know that this one, um, the right hip is also affected. I have another CT example for you. Um, so this is a six-year-old female spade mixed breed dog. Um, she had a fainting spell um, and she was coughing. So these x-rays, um, there's a lot going on in them. So we'll kind of uh, walk through it slowly. But first and foremost, lung is supposed to be black. And I know um, based on my uh, anatomy that I should have a big lung tip here and I should have a big lung tip here. Well, this is not black. Um, I also should have lung that comes all the way up and then this side come all the way up. Well, this is also not black. It is something is occupying that. So just to show you an example of what normal looks like, um, these bits, uh, the lung, either the lungs are filled with something or something is pushing the lungs out of the way. Um, and we really don't, uh, based on the x-rays, know how to characterize this because it could be many things just on these. It could be a lung tumor. It could be a lymph node within the cranial thorax. It could be a tumor within the cranial thorax. It could be a tumor of the esophagus. It could just be a big esophagus and the dog ate something really, really big um, and it couldn't pass all the way through um, to the stomach. 
there is no way to tell just on x-rays um, what this structure is and why um, it's kind of either pushing the lungs or, or invading the lungs. So uh, this dog went to CT to better characterize where is this coming from and, and what's happening. Um, so CT is gonna be very similar to an X-ray. So this is lateral, his head's over here. This is um, him laying on his back, his head is up here. And then this is actually taking that transverse slice. So kind of uh, right through the body, um, slicing it like bread. What we found was actually not what we were thinking at all. Um, it's not of the lungs, the lungs are black here. It's not of the lymph nodes, which live more cranial up here. This big old mass was actually of the heart. Um, again, we could not see that um, just on the x-rays and you can see it here. This is our big mass. Um, and then this white stuff, we gave this dog um, contrast in its vein to really uh, identify the vascular structures, the uh, veins and arteries. And so most of this white, is a vein, but this big guy is sitting um, right on our heart and we can see it in all images. So we couldn't tell this, I'll go back to the x-rays just to show you guys. This does not look like heart at all. It's way too cranial. Well, it's more cranial than we imagined. Heart should be sitting here. Sure, it touches the heart, it's right here. And the heart should sit right here. It touches the heart but that's not what we had prioritized. So it just goes to show that it's, it, it's very difficult on x-ray sometime to, to see where things are. So x-rays are a really good tool to kind of rule some things in or some things out and say, well, it's not this, or yeah, this was you know a relatively quick and simple diagnosis. Some of these other cases though, really do need um, this advanced imaging to, to characterize it. Not only to say what structure it's in, but how much of the heart does it affect? Does it um, you know, go into the vessels? Can we resect this um, in surgery or is this you know, not a surgical option? This case, unfortunately, lived in the majority of the right atrium. So that upper right portion uh, or chamber of the heart and this uh, was not resectable. Uh, CT also shows us some pretty cool stuff. This is just that 3D reconstruction of the CT scan. Here's heart um, here with the big vessels coming out of it. Um, but here's that tumor. And so it shows us just how closely associated it is um, with our heart. It also shows us more information that even if we tried to go in and resect this, man, we could try our darndest, but do you see all these little spindly vessels? They're really tortuous and, and windy and curvy and really small. Those are new vessels, those aren't normal vessels, those are new vessels that that tumor has basically created to supply itself with blood. So if we went and resected this out, that is gonna grow back very quickly. It has a, a very high blood supply. There's no way that we would have seen this um, on the other imaging studies. So one example of why CT is really important. Okay, MRI, um, this is also a, a Cool case only because it is so hard to see this lesion um, until you do the MRI. Uh, some of the other cases you're like, yeah, it's there. We don't know where it's at. No, this one, we, we literally had such a hard time seeing it. So this is a 10 year old male intact Rottweiler. And he had a acute meaning short onset um, of not being able um, to walk or, or walking weekly. So it was kind of an intermix. Um, he, he didn't want to walk, but when we got him up he could very weakly do it with support. Um, the neurology team uh, put a localization of between the third thoracic and the third lumbar uh, vertebra. So um, T3 through L3 and gave him a uh, basically a disease of the spinal cord, which is what myelopathy means. So when we look, um, the last part of the rib is here. Dogs have 13 ribs. So I know this is the 13th thoracic vertebra. Dogs also have seven lumbar vertebra. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, okay, he's got seven, he's good to go. Um, so dogs have eight, uh, it's just, it, he was born that way, but we like to count and make sure. So we were looking between T13 
and L7 here to kind of look in this region, even though the localization could have been a little bit wider, um, we were looking here. Um, I will highlight the abnormalities for you um, and you'll kind of be able to see them uh, on the x-ray. So we're looking at bone and I've changed the uh, contrast of these images to help identify it, but it's within this um, L3, the third lumbar vertebra um, on both views that we can see. And I, I gave us a vertebra in front of and behind the lesion uh, in, well, I guess in this one, and then a vertebra in front of the lesion here. So we can see this dark black um, opacity uh, that is abnormal compared to the other vertebra here, super subtle. I'm gonna go back and just show you like it is here, but man, is that difficult to see. Even, I mean, even experts would say that this is a difficult case to see just on x-rays, um, but we did identify it, fortunately. Um, also to note that this side is not the same as this side, right? This is more white, it's more opaque. So something is happening on the right side of this uh, third lumbar vertebra. When we go to MRI, um, we, we, the same, same vertebra, L3, um, this is the same view as the x-ray up top. Um, this is the same view as the other x-ray that we had. So looking at the dog um, laying on his back, laying on his side. And then this is that transverse view again, kind of slicing the dog like bread, if you will. Um, and what we do see is that within the spinal cord, there is this um, lesion. And so we don't know if this is hematoma, blood clot, if it is a tumor, and if it is tumor, is this tumor of spinal cord? Is this tumor of bone? Uh, we, we just don't know um, based on just this. But when we start looking at these other views, it's not just, oh yeah, here's the tumor. Man, it really expands out into the tissues, which out here is muscle. And when we look on this view, it involves the spinal cord, it involves the vertebra body, the vertebra itself, the body of the vertebra, and it's starting to invade into that muscle. So this muscle is abnormal compared to this muscle. Um, closer, obviously it's more abnormal the closer we get to that um, lesion, but there is no way we could have seen this without MRI. Um, going back to the rads real quick, you just see that canal. The, spine, the spinal cord canal. You don't see the spinal cord, the CSF fluid. You see nothing but the bone here. Here, it really gives us some contrast for, you know, here's the spinal canal, here's some spinal cord, um, and we kind of lose, uh, or we have disrupt, disruption of that spinal cord. Not only that, but, so the, the, you know, this would uh, warrant surgical removal um, for the dog to, to do well, um, but we also see this intervertebral disc right here is abnormal compared to this intervertebral disc. So this from here to here is the vertebra. And then in between it is that uh, disc. This guy is not only protruded up into the spinal canal, but he um, has degeneration. Um, he doesn't have this nice bright white um, middle part. So if he goes to surgery, he's not only going to need surgery for this, but thank goodness we did MRI because, because he needs uh, this site done as well. So just a good, good example of how MRI can help. The MRI truly brings in a lot of good contrast between soft tissues, whereas CT, yeah, we can get good contrast with soft tissues, but not this good. CT is really, really good with bone um, and, and lung things. Uh, but soft tissue MRI is, is really the, the way to go in most cases, not all. Um, I wanted to share just a few extra case examples with you that I thought were fun. Um, so this, I'm gonna tell you right now, there's a foreign body, you know, he ate like a toy or something within his stomach, um, gastric just means stomach. Um, this is a three-year-old male neutered mixed breed dog. He has vomited five times within the last day. So I've really changed the contrast on this image to try to point um, something out. You may not believe me, but, but this little structure truly is um, something within his stomach that's not supposed to be there. When we get the orthogonal image, we can start to see that structure just a little bit better. And lo and behold, that was a 
what did it load? Oh, hold on. There it is there. Lo and behold, that's a pacifier. And you can totally see it. I think that case is so cool. Um, okay, next case. So I, I've talked about why is ultrasound important? Why is CT important? Why is MRI important? But I haven't really talked about why RADs are important. I've kind of said like, yeah, they're, they're a good way to start and they're a good way to kind of screen for certain diseases. But sometimes we, we really truly could answer a lot of questions with them. And this is what that case is gonna show you. Um, so this is a four-year-old female spade greyhound. Um, she had pleural effusion, meaning fluid within her chest cavity. Um, and she has been vomiting and, and pretty lethargic. Um, the doctor that referred this to the radiology team was really concerned for a torsion of the spleen or like the, the spleen twisting upon itself and cutting off blood supply. So um, she requested that one of my resident mates come in and ultrasound it. So these are just some ultrasound images. We see gallbladder, normal. Liver, we put blood flow on everything. This is what this color, it's color Doppler. So the red and blues just indicate blood flow within organs. And we were making sure that there was no torsion of these organs, no, no twisting of them. Um, so the liver is normal. It has a good blood supply. Here's stomach. It, it, it's really awkward because you're like, where, Jay? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, it's right here. Uh, everything else below this, you can't read. It's artifact from the gas that's within the stomach. So this little guy, similar to that small intestine I showed you earlier, has wall layering, just like the small intestine, but everything deep to that, you cannot see. It is all artifacts from gas. Um, this, this is, you can't tell anything from this uh, por portion of this uh, ultrasound image. Then we have spleen. Um, the spleen does have a nice vessel coming into it with good blood flow. So there's no splenic torsion. Here's kidney. We put color on kidney and lo and behold, it has a good blood flow. Um, bladder just to complete you know, the, all the organs. But then over by the spleen, so this is still spleen here with one of its big vessels. Um, over by the spleen, there's this little pocket of fluid, this guy. Um, my resident mate sampled this little pocket of fluid with um, a needle. And what came back on the cytology report was a really severe bacterial infection of the dog's abdomen. Um, so this was very concerning for, for something, whether that's you know rupture of the GI tract. When that GI tract, if it has a, let's for example, foreign body and it ruptures that GI tract, that bacteria and the food that's within the GI can leak out into the abdomen and cause really severe um, inflammation and make the dog really sick, life-threatening sick. So this was not good because we had no idea why. Uh, so we already did ultrasound. Well, I, let's go to CT and see what that shows us, right? Because CT is the way to go. Okay, well, on CT, we see this structure. These are transverse images slicing the dog like bread. This is a, um, a ventral dorsal image. So looking at the dog laying on his back. So head up here. This is a CT image of the dog laying on its side. So uh, head over here. This is just heart and lungs. So you have diaphragm and then abdomen. Uh, similar here. So here, this does look weird, but this is actually just normal lung. Uh, diaphragm is here. So the abdomen extends from here back. Okay, we have this big structure that we can see. It's really cavitated. It has bits of fluid, gas, uh, soft tissue material. Um, it, it's really got all of these different pieces of material within it. Um, and it lives um, kind of up by the, where'd I go? Here's liver. It lives up by the liver um, in the cranial part of the abdomen um, in all views. So this was diagnosed as an abscess of the liver, which explains why we had bacteria and really bad inflammation in our abdomen. Um, but, uh, you know, we say, well, shouldn't we have seen this on ultrasound? My answer is no. So no matter where you put this ultrasound probe, doesn't matter how you look at it, this structure is going to be covered up by the gas within the stomach. And that's what we did not see in this ultrasound image. So it wasn't a fact that, you know, we couldn't find the problem. It was a fact that our GI tract had a bunch of gas within it. And we simply 
could not get to it with the modality, with the ultrasound that we chose. Um, so ultrasound, you could argue, was in this case, was not the first step that should have been taken. Although for the suspected diagnosis of a splenic torsion, that was a, a great idea to do, go to ultrasound, right? Well, um, if we would have taken some RADs it first, some x-rays first, we may have seen here in the liver these little stipples of gas. And really up in the liver, the stomach sits back here. I'll kind of draw the line of the stomach for you. Um, there's not going to be gas in that liver unless you have um, something like an abscess. Uh, the gallbladder really should not have gas in it. Here's some more gas. Um, and then here's some gas. So I guess long story to long kind of story to show you that x-rays are important. I, I talked a lot about why we might need other things, but you know, when we recommend an x-ray first, um, sometimes there's a reason to that. And, and x-rays could have answered this dog's questions instead of doing ultrasound and then CT. That's what I got for you. We did have a question about the- I'm sorry. Um, is someone talking? It's Nancy. We did have a question, Jay, about the severe fracture. Yeah. On the pelvis? And, yeah. Do, do you remember how that was treated? Was that plates and pins? Yep. Um, so not all of these fractures um, were fixed. So let me go up to the pelvis image and I'll, and I'll kind of go back and forth here. Oh, sorry. Too far. So that head of the femur, and I'm sorry I missed that question when it popped up. I wasn't looking over there. Um, hold on. Here it is. Okay, so the the way we decide if we're going to fix pelvic pelvic fractures is whether or not when the dog bears weight is that piece of bone going to be bearing the weight of the dog? And the answer is not all of the pelvis actually does that. So uh, the weight you know, comes up through the foot, up through the tibia, femur. So the acetabulum here in um, purple bears, has the most weight bearing access here. So if the acetabulum is fractured, we have to repair that. And then anything up through the wing of the ilium, which is the red bit here, so acetabulum here, and then up through the wing also has to be repaired because this is going to distribute this way weight onto the sacrum, which is that caudal part of our spine, and it's going to then distribute that weight up through the spine and through the back. So in that dog, I can go back down to it. I'm so sorry, my internet is slow. So that dog, that feet, the head of the femur was placed back on because of that other hip joint being abnormal. Then they had, I wish I had an image of it for you. I should have put that in here. Um, then they had to plate the acetabulum and use um, screws to and plates to put the wing of the ilium back in. So the pelvis was fixed. Oh, I'm so sorry, this is slow. Uh, the pelvis was fixed in multiple places, but not all fractures were because there it is, because they were not weight bearing axes. So this was all fixed here. This head was put back on the femur. This was fixed here, but all of this bit right through here was not fixed. And I'll go back to the 3D image of it. So all of these little pieces were not. This was reconnected. The head was put back on here, and then these two bones were reconnected. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. 
the little pieces they will i yeah it's just saw your text kathy um all the little pieces will actually form uh when bone is upset and broken it forms its own little bone to reconnect pieces um sometimes that's just cartilage that forms but most of the time especially like in dogs and in the pelvis it's going to form bone and be one big kind of mess of bone to restabilize all of itself so that if we don't fix this and I actually had a case that would have been a good case to use i actually had a case with a chronic like many years ago a uh, pelvic fracture that was never repaired and if you can imagine this pelvis putting together a lot of bone to stabilize this on its own the canal here is really narrowed that dog frequently had problems um, passing stool and would get um, uh, constipated routinely and would have to come in for us to, to do an enema to relieve it. Um, so this has implications in and of itself um, to, to kind of repair and put back together. Here's another question from Deb. What would you do if it didn't heal after a while? Um, so yeah, so th these bits, um, when we plate them, uh, they, they will heal unless there's infection. Healing is uh, gonna be much faster in our younger patients, like you know our puppies and even up to like three years old, and obviously much slower in 11, 12, 13 year old dogs. Um, if these didn't heal, we would do nothing because the, the weight is not, um, not distributed and eventually, these little bones back here would act, the body would actually uh, resorb them. Fascinating. I was struck by how much the canine tibia and fibula look like the human tibia. Oh, yeah. and fibula. I would love to actually get my hands on them to compare. Yeah. I thought about too, I thought about putting some human bones in here, but I was like, yeah, I better just stick to dogs. <laughs> the humerus looks remarkably like the human humerus also. Yeah. Well, all of the bones, oh, I should have put that in here. Let me open up if you will just uh, appease me. Let me open up a different lecture that I put on for some high school students because I have an image in there. You guys are going to be amazed. We have all of the same bones. Dogs don't have a clavicle, but we have pretty much all the same bones and they're all uh, relatively the same, a yeah, little bit sh different shaped maybe, a little bit different lengths, but they are pretty cool. Let me just... And this, my friends, is why I love anatomy and physiology. It's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. Sorry, okay, one second. Take your time, no rush. I totally should have put that in. I thought about it. Oh, there's another chat that I can't see. Does that? I'll check it out. That, yeah, I thought the anatomy was very similar. Human to dog, yep. That's from Becky Robinson, who is a PT. She's a, oh, did they send us an image? Uh, no, that, that was her comment that. Okay, that, it's loading. Sorry. That's not the right thing. Come on. My internet is so stinking slow. <laughs> I'm sorry. There you go, it's coming up. Okay. Vet basics. Yep. <laughs> trying to get it up for you guys. This is what I deal with. Come on, come on. Time to upgrade, Jay. Oh, I actually just got an email today saying that they were upgrading my thing uh, for $5 extra a month. And I was like, please do, please do that. Double the speed, man. <laughs> this is just ridiculous, come on. Come on, here, it's gonna be the next slide. Next, oh, I drew on this too, that's weird. It's weird. Do you see my green marks on my screen? We do. I don't know what that's from. 
Just load the picture. There it comes. Okay, it's coming. It's coming. Literally the same bones. Yes. We're not special. <laughs> no, we're not. Here's an example of just like when you go, the dog has multiple bones like us in our hand, right? But the horse only has one. It really correlates just to our middle finger. Um, so similar in dogs, here's a really cool one. Just showing you the difference of dog, pig, cow, horse, um, and how even throughout species, they're, they're really all the same. Oh yeah, pelvis is, yes, <laughs> accurate. There's actually my, uh, what the, the comment was, uh, pelvis is completely different, bipedal and uh, quadrupedal. Uh, my professor actually took an image of my dog laying on the CT machine. Their head, the head is also different, right? Like we stand straight up on our two hind limbs and our face faces forward. Well, the dog stands, down on all four limbs their face doesn't face towards the ground like ours would if we did that it faces forward still and so there's a really pretty pretty cool image that we have of a human and my dog sitting in the ct scanner and and how that is is slightly different hmm. i have a question um about some of the terminology you were talking about yeah. um so i thought like in a horse the carpus or this is what I learned, and it might be different now. In a horse, the carpus is called the knee. Yep. Uh, but in dogs, I've always called the carpus the wrist, and I call the stifle the knee. Has yep. that changed? Nope. That is exactly right. So the only thing I would say that changes is we no longer call the dog the wrist. The wrist is truly just a human term. But if you said wrist, everyone would know what you're talking about. Um, so it's fine to call it the wrist, but yes, the dog knee is the stifle. It is in the hind limb, um, but the horse knee is the carpus in the front limb. So this is the horse knee. This is the dog knee. That is accurate. So what do they call the stifle in a horse? The stifle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, folks? Fascinating. Thank you very much, Jenny. Yeah, I hope you guys learned something. I had a lot of fun putting it together, so I hope it was. I hope it was good. And that you were, yeah, it was wonderful. I just want to know what happened to all those dogs. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, I thought about putting their end story in, but some of them are not so happy. So I, I thought I wouldn't do that. Some of them are good, good but yeah. yeah. It's fascinating. And thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Great, great, great program. Excellent, folks. Anything else, guys, or we'll cut, we'll cut uh, Jay loose. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I, I think that's it, Jay. Thank you so much for your Thank time you. and your energy. Much appreciated. Yeah, of course. Happy to do it. And you have a whole bunch of happy dog owners. Yeah, good. I'll um I'll end the call. I'll, I'll stop recording. I'll end the call and I'll call you.